I think I've always really appreciated the Beatles sort of like swagger almost like I, I really like how they sort of went from like these clean cut, you know, suit and Chelsea boot wearing boys to really being kind of like style and fashion icons as well. And sort of being some of the first to, you know, start being a little bit more open about uh, about drug culture and not really caring that they were pushing these like social and, and musical boundaries and, you know, and finding that a lot of their fans were, you know, either experiencing the same things or, or willing to, you know, go along with that. I mean, you know, they were really a huge part of like 60s counterculture developing and, and all of that. And, and I really appreciated that they were sort of always willing to be on the forefront of those things and that they, um, you know, and, and that in that being a little bit more open about their personal lives and experiences and song, you know, they, they influenced me to sort of see that as like, a, a, you know, a path that I could take for myself as well. I mean, not only in writing, but but being, you know, being true to myself as I as I went through life and as I decided to be a performer. Youngsters from Liverpool, England. The Beatles have held this title for eight years. My model of business is the Beatles. You know, they were four very talented guys. <laughs> Welcome back to the Here, There, and Everywhere podcast. I'm your host, Jack Lawless. Today, I'd like to welcome Carson McKee on the podcast. Carson is a folk musician from Charlotte, North Carolina. You might know him best as the lead vocalist and principal songwriter of the music duo, The Other Favorites, which features his longtime collaborator, Josh Turner, who was also on the podcast earlier this year. Carson and Josh post their songs to YouTube, where their videos have been enjoyed by millions of people worldwide. And Carson's been involved in music basically his entire life, either by listening or playing. He's also a Beatles fan, and I'm really excited to talk with him about that. So let's jump right into the interview. Hey, Carson, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. How are you today? I am. I'm doing all right. Gearing up for my my European tour with uh, Josh and Raina Dulcet and Tony Lindgren. So, you know, just kind of checking to make sure I have all my my power adapters and strings and everything and just sort of gearing up, but feeling excited for that. And uh, yeah, having a good week so far. Oh, that's awesome. That's really exciting. And Carson, we were just talking about how big of a Beatles fan you are. Can you tell us how you first heard their music? Yeah, so I first heard their music from my mom and dad, just them playing their CDs and records around the house. And that's really how I heard everything growing up. I come from a very musical family. Um, My mom played piano growing up, and on my dad's side of the family, you can trace music back like generations. You know, he plays guitar and sings. All of his brothers do as well. They're all very talented. Their dad played guitar and sang. His dad was the musical director at a primitive Baptist church. So it really goes back generations. And and because of that, there was always music playing around my house. And I discovered a lot of what ended up being influences for me that way. And uh, yeah, the Beatles, you know, being one band among many. And can you remember what you thought when you first heard the Beatles? You know, it's kind of funny. I remember... Like when I first heard the Beatles, when I first started really paying attention, I was probably like almost but not quite a teenager. And that was before I started playing guitar and, you know, started having ambitions of being a musician myself. And I remember really liking a lot of it, you know, just having the experience I think everybody has of just feeling compelled to sing along to like the Love Me Do's and She Loves You's of the world. But I also remember like sitting in my room not long after I got my first iPod, which was probably like 2005 or six, and just digging. My dad had like every album. So just like, you know, once I discovered some of the early stuff and really liked it, I went like deep diving into their catalog. And at the time, I remember kind of being freaked out by like the more psychedelic experimental stuff. (laughs) Like I remember, you know, listening to Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and kind of just knowing like, oh, this is, you know some drug references in this like I didn't know anything about that so that was like a little spooky for me and then some songs like Blue Jay Way are actually like 
even today are kind of like scary sounding a lot of like sound effects and all like the back masking stuff yeah so yeah i, I had a i had like an initial experience where i really love some of their stuff and then when, when i went digging around i was like at equal turns really impressed and like a little bit spooked at some of the experimentation they were doing <laughs> so how did the beatles music compare to the contemporary music that was out around the time when you started to get deeper into the beatles yeah so at that age, I was kind of like, like misguidedly, I don't know if elitist is the right word, but I like since I grew up listening to what my dad listened to, I had this sort of idea that, you know, that classic rock, like 60s, 70s era was like the ultimate representation of like what music should be. And so when I started, you know, coming across like, more modern stuff, indie rock. I mean, pretty much anything from like the 2000s up top 40 from that era. I sort of turned my nose up at it. And I had this idea that like, oh, well, the Beatles, like that's like the best music and all this stuff now is just super diluted and like commercial compared to that. And thankfully, I sort of I was able to expand my horizons in college and like beyond. And, you know, now I have a great appreciation of most genres and eras of music and once i was able to do that a little bit then i started i was sort of like you know rewarded with the discovery that a lot of you know modern music is influenced by the beatles and i was able to sort of draw that connection and and you know that was that was a fun thing to discover once i sort of opened my eyes a little bit and at which point did you decide that you want to pick up the guitar and start playing and singing professionally i think when I was third, 2006, like I said before, I, you know, I grew up in a musical household and listening to my dad play guitar. And every time I would go, you know, to my grandma's house for Thanksgiving or Christmas or, you know, what have you after the meal at nighttime, all my, my dad and, and my uncles would sort of gather around and play guitar and sing. And hearing that from a young age, I really wanted to, you know, I saw the sort of sense of community they had and, and how much fun they had playing and singing together and harmonizing. And I really wanted that, you know, for myself. So that, that was a huge part of my influence. And then also around that time, around 13, my dad showed me the Bob Dylan documentary, the Martin Scorsese Dylan documentary, No Direction Home. I saw that film and that really, really like blew my mind. You know, I had never heard music like that before. Like I'd never heard lyrics painting a picture like that and i think at the time i was also really enamored with i was sort of enamored with like the character of bob dylan and his mystique but also the sort of like hold he had over audiences and you know his his performance style and so all of that sort of came together and as soon as i started playing and, and figured out that i sort of had a knack for it i was like oh well i you know i i would love to to pursue this and kind of like have these things for myself so yeah that was sort of the beginning oh cool yeah bob dylan was a huge influence even to the beatles and i know that one of your first videos that really went viral was your cover of don't think twice it's all right with josh turner you know can you actually take us through your journey from how you met josh to deciding to put your music on youtube and starting the other favorites yeah so josh josh and i sort of had like have like inverse Traje like beginning trajectories almost where it took me a long time to start posting on my own YouTube channel. But Josh was really like an early adopter of YouTube. He started posting in 2007, back when YouTube was very, very different. And I don't think at the time he had, you know, ambitions of building like a huge musical empire or anything. He just, you know, he, I think he just liked the idea of sharing his music and you know, finding people who appreciated the same thing and finding other artists who were doing similar things. And, you know, I would show up in his channel from time to time. And through that, the other favorites sort of gained a following, you know, a a as like along with his solo endeavors. And yeah, so I remember performing a lot on his channel and being able to build an audience that way but it took me a long time to sort of have the ambition to try to do my own solo stuff on youtube i think maybe i felt like i would be stepping on josh's toes or something but he actually influenced me to do it and you know my my parents and i you know i had a lot of friends and family telling me to do the same thing but 
eventually I realized like, well, you know, if a huge part of my fan base comes from YouTube, then it kind of makes sense to try to migrate that a little bit over to my own solo thing where I can dive into country music and, and you know, some influences that I have that were sort of external to the other favorites. But yeah, Josh and I started playing together in 2006. We met at our, our eighth grade talent show and sort of immediately like recognize one another as as you know musically compatible it's sort of like yin and yang of like me playing and writing and sort of being like a lead vocalist type and josh being really really good having a great ear for harmonies and arranging and being a great guitar player so yeah we formed a band thanks to another classmate of ours cole gage who played mandolin and sort of approached us to, to be in a bluegrass band and yeah, the, the rest is history. I started posting on YouTube, playing at Battle of the Bands, and you know everything sort of bloomed out from there. And would you say that the Beatles have influenced your life in other ways aside from just a musical influence? Yeah, I think so. It's a, it's a little bit of a tough question because the musical influence is definitely like the primary thing I can point to. But I, I think I've always really appreciated the Beatles sort of like swagger almost. Like I... I really like how they sort of went from like these clean cut, you know, suit and Chelsea boot wearing boys to really being kind of like style and fashion icons as well. And sort of being some of the first to, you know, start being a little bit more open about about drug culture and not really caring that they were pushing these like social and and musical boundaries and, you know, and finding that a lot of their fans were, you know, either experiencing the same things or, or willing to you know, go along with that. I mean, you know, they they were really a huge part of like 60s counterculture developing and and all of that. And and I really appreciated that they were sort of always willing to be on the forefront of those things and that they, you know, and, and that in that being a little bit more open about their personal lives and experiences and song, you know, that they, they had influenced me to sort of see that as like, a, a, you know, a path that I could take for myself as well. I mean, not only in writing, but but being, you know, being true to myself as I as I went through life and as I decided to be a performer. So you mentioned that the Beatles have had an influence on you musically. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Like, did they influence your music taste? Or when you're writing songs, you're more inclined to write in their style of music? Definitely both. The Beatles, I've always, even from a young age, I always really appreciated how the Beatles, like, kind of, perfectly blended approachability and accessibility with, you know, experimentation and some more complicated ideas. Like, you know, through their chord progressions, their melodies and their harmonies, anybody can kind of get into their music and, you know, want to tap their feet or sing along. But then once you dig in, there are these really complicated musical ideas and lyrical ideas that can be happening and and really complicated uses of the recording studio kind of as its own instrument. And as I started playing, I, I really wanted to figure out why their music was so effective and how they were able to blend, you know, the accessible and the complex. Because, you know, I, I saw the influence they had in terms of just everybody loving the Beatles, and I knew how their music made me feel. And I really wanted to be able to produce that feeling as well. Um, so I really sort of leaned heavy into especially Paul's use of of melody and chords to tell a story. And I feel like with kind of with every song that I write, that DNA is in what I do. And you've actually posted quite a few Beatles cover videos on YouTube. I'm wondering which one was your favorite to cover? I think Don't Let Me Down was probably my favorite one to cover. That's one I've been wanting to do for a long time, and I got to do it with Josh and Raina and Tony. So we, you know, we had like a multiple part harmony going on, and we were able to sort of really like dig into the, you know, the rhythms and and tempos that make that song interesting. And it ended up being sort of one of the first videos on my channel that kind of like picked up major traction with the YouTube algorithm. So not only was it fun to cover, but it was sort of beneficial in that way, too. I think it brought a lot of new ears to my channel. But yeah, that was definitely the most fun. So which Beatles song is your favorite? Man, that is that is really tough. It really that really like changes with changes with my mood. Let me 
It, yeah, that that's tough to say. I mean, well, let me rephrase that actually because there are so many Beatles songs, and it's it's impossible to pick one for a true fan. So, which Beatles song is the most impressive to you? Well, I I, I think that I, I I'm not. <laughs> This is going to be annoying because I'm not going to be able to pick one. But <laughs> to me, there are like two types of Beatles song that are like really, really impressive. And one is the like Paul McCartney's sort of like really simple but really beautiful and haunting songs like Yesterday and Blackbird, like songs that can really stand on their own that have really interesting chord progressions and guitar parts, um, but they're really, really direct and to the point and plaintive um so yeah i mean it's hard to pick between those two and then on sort of the other end of the spectrum you have the later period beatles stuff like abbey road where on songs like i want you she's so heavy they just groove together so well as a band and are able to play off of each other in in a really really beautiful way and, and that is really difficult and impressive to try to replicate or like come together has a great you know sort of sense of ensemble as well so yeah, I know that's not really an answer, but but those are the two like types of Beatles songs <laughs> that are typically my favorite. Yes, I completely agree. Because songs like I Will, you wouldn't think that would be one of their most impressive songs if you read the Wikipedia article before listening to it. Like it's practically just Paul on the guitar. It's just under two minutes in length. But when you listen to it, it's like uh, you can't believe someone pulled this melody out of thin air. It's like one of those songs that existed forever. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. And that like the Beatles are, that's one of the things they do really well. It's like these songs that feel like they've always kind of been a part of us and our DNA, you know, and, and they just like, especially during that like mid, mid to late sixties era, they just like, they were just cranking that stuff out. Like, I don't even, I don't know how they wrote so many incredibly impactful songs in that period of time, that like super fertile period. But yeah. Even also on the white album, like, Paul was really good at that, but, but, you know, John was as well. I mean, Julia is another example of like, it's just him and the guitar. And that song is just so beautiful and haunting and like, you know, almost painful in its expression of emotion. Yeah. I, I, it's like that, that is a sort of standard that I always like seek to be able to replicate in my own work, but, you know, feel like I can never quite re reach those heights. <laughs> so how about a favorite memory that's associated with the Beatles? When from the time I was like 15 until 2016, uh, my dad and brother and Josh and I would go every summer to uh, a music camp in the mountains of North Carolina called the Swannanoa Gathering. And it was sort of set up as like a workshop type thing where, you know, they would bring in experts in anything from flat picking to songwriting. And you would take a couple of classes a day from these people. But at night... Once everybody had eaten dinner, the whole camp would sort of devolve into this like massive, you know, like multi-part jam. Like there'd be jam circles all over the campus of Warren Wilson College, which is where it was held. You know, people would like, you know, there's a beer tent and a food tent. People would stay up way too late, drink way too much and just like have a great time. And one of the traditions that sort of evolved from those jam nights was a Beatles jam on Thursday nights where... That was where the majority of people kind of focused. I don't know how many people it was, like 50 plus, huge circle of people. And it was led by a guy named John Tosco, who is sort of a, a huge face in the Charlotte music scene. And yeah, people would bring guitars. You know what? I mean, some people, like, I think somebody brought like, people would bring like melodicas, flutes for like Fool on the Hill. You know, oh, anybody wow. who wanted to play along and who knew the chords, you know, were welcome to do so. But most people just showed up to sing harmonies. And they would go through like almost the Beatles whole catalog and just stay up to like three or four in the morning singing <laughs> songs. And not only was it just like immediately fun to be a part of that, but it was just such a perfect representation of how the Beatles bring people together and, you know, how important it is to so many folks, because there's this huge sense of joy and positivity in those jam circles where it's like you can kind of look around and see like, wow, this music that really meant so much to me growing up also meant the same amount to all of these people. And it was just such like a clear and immediate way to see that. So yeah, th those probably are some of my favorite Beatles memories. Although, you know, again, it's kind of hard to pick. Oh, totally. 
And speaking of the Beatles bringing everyone together, what do you think about their recent resurgence in popularity? Like with the Get Back documentary coming out and the new remixes of Let It Be and Revolver. Well, it's like, I feel like it's something that's just going to keep happening. I mean, not specifically like remixes and reissues, but it's, it seems like the Beatles just like never quite go away from the forefront of popular culture, you know? And I think that speaks to a lot of what we've talked about today. It's like just the fact that their songs kind of always feel like they're a part of us and their cultural influence feels that way as well. It's like every 10 years, a new generation kind of latches on the Beatles and, and has that experience too. And so it's just cool for me to see that even as we get further and further away from, you know, when they were active, the cultural interest in the Beatles and like the general love of them just kind of, it's like a flame that stays lit. And so to me, that's sort of an example of like how that will probably continue to go. And I, I hope it does. And it's like, I, I'm, I'm particularly really interested in the, in the remixes, you know, I, like I would, it's like, it's a personal preference thing. I'm sure. I, mean, I think there are a lot of purists who are probably like, why are you redoing this? But, <laughs> but it, it is like another, especially with all the bonus tracks, it's just like another opportunity to see like how they worked and why they were so successful. And actually the revolver one, I'm really, I'm kind of going off on a tangent now, but I'm really curious about the revolver one, because I think I remember reading an interview with Giles Martin where he was like, I don't know if we have the technology to do this yet because, you know, since a lot of this was recorded on a four track machine and bounced down, you know, we have the tapes, but it's like, there might be a couple of instruments on one track and, you know, being able to separate those, I don't know if we're there yet. So I'm actually really curious about like technically how they pulled that off. But yeah. I've been hoping for a revolver and, and like a rubber soul remix for a long time since they're already doing this. Yeah. It, it's really nuts. I mean, they're even doing a Dolby Atmos remix of revolver. Wild. which is just like incomprehensible. I can't even, I can't wait to hear that. Oh uh, yeah. I have, I have Dolby, I have like Dolby Atmos in my living room cause I'm insane. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> it's not, it's actually, it's not really a great example of Dolby Atmos. Like I've heard people's like home theater setups where it's like perfectly calibrated and like the rooms are treated. And actually the Andy really, the guy who recorded our album naysayer, he said he has an Atmos set up in his home studio. And I was like floored by that. I think he played like a rumors remix. And it's like, you really get a sense of things like flying in overhead. And it's super, super cool. But oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So speaking of the Revolver remix, which song are you most excited to hear remixed? Mm, I. I'm curious to hear what I think Tomorrow Never Knows would be a great one because there's a lot of sound effects on that, you know, like some backmasking, some interesting guitar stuff. They really sort of get into the weeds and it's like a bizarre, like trippy experience. But it, I, I bet they would have a lot of, you know, opportunities to like play around with stereo. And even in Dolby Atmos, I think they can kind of like move things around the channels in a cool way. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That that one, that one, I think there's a lot of room for for some experimentation. Yeah, I'm I'm so stoked for this album to come out. I mean, I can't wait to hear it. I I can't wait to hear Giles Martin remix the earlier albums, but I know that might take a little bit longer because I think they were recorded on like two track or something like that. Something like that. Yeah, I those those I really enjoy like listening to the like the mono versions because it seems like the stereo versions are like, all right, so, you know, we've got all the instruments and we've got the vocals. So let's just like smack the vocals over in the right channel and the instruments over in the left channel, and like call it a day. Yeah. And it's like really, it's like really disorienting. <laughs> yeah. But the mono mixes are really cool. I mean, like that's how they were originally conceived to be. And, you know, like the balance, they just spent more time mixing them and, and making sure everything was was right. And it, it just it just sounds a little bit more like together for me. But but who knows? I mean you mentioned you mentioned the the get back film and one of the you probably already know this but what, like one of the technologies that peter jackson and his crew developed for that film was the ability to use like computers and ai i think yeah to separate out elements of like basically a mono recording i mean there are a lot of instances where there was like one mic up or like two mics up in the room or something it's not like they had like a multi-track of when they were jamming of like, oh, Paul's guitar and like, you know, or like Paul's bass and like John's guitar and stuff. 
but they were able to like feed in sounds and footage of like, okay, this is what a guitar sounds like. This is what drums sound like. You know, this is what the human voice sounds like. And, and they were actually able to like, at least to a certain degree, separate out individual instances from a completely like mixed down mono track. So I don't know. I mean, they might have the the technology to be able to like convincingly pull certain elements from like what was originally a two track recording, but I don't know. Do you have a favorite Beatle? De- definitely Paul. Josh and I are pretty squarely in the in the Paul McCartney camp. He is he is just an incredible musician. His sense of melody is wonderful. His chord knowledge is especially in that like 1967 through like 70 71 period his knowledge of 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 theory and his instincts on like when to use certain chords just truly great and i think that there's this sort of like oversimplification that happens when people are talking about the beatles where they're like oh like john is sort of like the the edgy like you know he's like the edgy cool like emotionally savvy writer and paul is sort of the more like you know bubblegummy you know like like maybe overly like complex musical one but i i really think that like to it to me personally paul has always been the most emotionally impactful beetle even with that sort of like representation you know we were talking about like yesterday and and blackbird i mean those are like yeah they're they're prettier sounding than you know, the like Julia's and, you know, happiness is a warm guns of the world, but they're, they're no less emotionally impactful. And I mean, in some ways almost more so, but yeah, the way, the way that just Paul's musical, Paul's musical aptitude and the way he was also able to sort of act as an arranger and band leader and later in the Beatles career has just always been really inspiring to me. So. You know, when you were talking about Paul's like 1967 to 72 phase, it, it makes me want to ask you, what do you think of their solo careers? Like, do you have a favorite album after the Beatles? You know, I, I'm not like, I'm definitely less familiar with the solo career Beatles, but I really love as, you know, this is like classic McCartney fan, but I really love McCartney, the solo album. And I've, I've really come to appreciate Ram as well. When I was younger, I used to say that All Things Must Pass was my favorite, which that might be like the strongest collection of songs and writing of all the like early Beatles solo stuff. But there's McCartney and Ram are so they're so charming and they both even in some of like the simpler songs and like instrumental bits, they sort of continue Paul's Paul's sort of most like fruitful writing and recording phase. They're just both really lovely albums. So th- those are probably my two favorites. And they, I think I re- I read like a retrospective review of Ram on Pitchfork. I think, and the person said something like, you know, you could kind of consider Ram like the prototypical indie album. And I think that's really cool. I think that's actually a really like a really smart read on it because it was not common for artists to like bring home really expensive recording equipment from the studio and like make an album at their house. But that's what Paul did. And, you know, even though some of the songs are like super casual and it's clearly just him like messing around, it really like just gives you a sense of like his humanity and like musical ideas. Yeah. So I, I like I like I like a lot of their early solo career stuff, but McCartney and, and Ram are the ones that kind of speak to me the most. Yeah, same here. But you know, Ram got like slammed when it first came out. It was not viewed favorably, like at all, from critics or fans. Neither neither of those albums were. But yeah, I think yeah, Ram in particular was viewed as just like really strange and like not living up to you know what people saw as like Paul's potential at the time. But I like that he was willing to just, he, you know, he was like, screw it. Like, this is the music I want to make. You know, like I'm having this like I'm trying to emotionally recover from the Beatles breakup. But I'm also like beginning this more like idyllic life with my wife and kids in Scotland. And, you know, I'm just going to make the music that that appeals to me. Like, I don't really care what the critics think. Just gives you such, like a raw look into what was going on to in, in his mind. And I really appreciate that. But yeah, those albums were like slammed when they first came out. I, I know. Yeah, they really were. <laughs> and 
And what I find interesting is that like when the Beatles first debuted, there were so many groups trying to make songs that sounded like the Beatles, but I've never really heard a song that sounds like Uncle Albert or Monkberry Moon Delight. Those songs to me sound like they're so unique to that album. And in retrospect, it's probably one of the best albums to ever be recorded. Yeah, I, I honestly like I don't have any specific examples, but I, t- I, I totally agree with that. And I would say that like you don't start hearing stuff that sounded like that until like decades later. You know, like once you get into like the late 90s, early 2000s, like that sort of like Indian, like, you know, home recording revolution as people were able to, you know, afford digital equipment a little bit more readily. Like that's when you started to hear stuff that sounded like Ram, which is just like he was he really was so ahead of his time, which I think is something that that isn't often mentioned in that oversimplification I was talking about earlier, where people are like, oh, John's like the edgy one and Paul's like the bubblegum one. Like the influence that Paul had was was, you know, really huge despite you know the fact that sometimes he had some like candy coated influences but i don't know i i think that's really background to like you know what he was really good at so what about a favorite beatles album that really fluctuates as well but the ones the two that i really often go back and forth on are revolver and abbey road um Revolver is just like kind of that perfect melding of their accessibility and their approachability in terms of like melody and harmony writing and arranging with some of the more studio and like writing experimental stuff that they would like go into even deeper with Sgt. Pepper. Um, And yeah, that's just that's just kind of like a real pinnacle of those things for me. Plus, it's just like banger after banger after banger and then and then abbey road is to me it's sort of like head and shoulders above a lot of other beatles records in terms of their sense of ensemble like they really are able to stretch out into grooves together and you know it's it, that that's one of the only beatles albums where like i make that like i make like the stank face when i'm listening to it or like <laughs> oh man like that was dirty like oh ringo's really dragging that you know <laughs> like i want you she's so heavy it's like man they they like they really just like lock in together and i like it because like you know that was when by the end of their run you know that was when they together we're all sort of like the most musically competent as well it's some of george's best guitar work some of ringo's best drumming um and and yeah i just i find that album to be in in some ways the most musically impressive so yeah i I sort of vacillate between those two but hopefully that's a specific enough of an answer (laughs) yeah so but let's say hypothetically the beatles never broke up how do you think they would have sounded in the 70s do you think they would have like went for a more at home ram sounding album or like a more heavy in the studio plastic ono band sound that yeah that that's actually really hard to say i i have to imagine that they would continue on sort of a more like traditional studio route but actually at the same time like paul was doing the most like sort of like raw sounding stuff but a lot of all things must pass i think was recorded like at george's like super nice home studio I think john was recording some stuff at home so who knows maybe they i, I maybe they would have devolved into a little bit more of like a diy thing where they're like yeah you know we really don't need to go in the studio and like sort of have this super super cohesive experience like we had with abbey road so yeah i don't know maybe i i have to i have to think that maybe the first album back in the 70s would be a little bit more like a little bit more raw like all of them playing together live but maybe recorded in a little bit less of a of a formal setting but i also think that they would you know they would probably take on some of the influences of the time as well like i don't know they were sort of always hip to like what trends were going on i think they would have no problem like incorporating some like disco and like soul and funk elements into what they were doing 80s is really tough it's really hard to imagine like a beatles album with like phil collinsy sounding drums and like synths and stuff but with Paul, with Paul kind of going ham on synths in McCartney too, you know, I honestly like, and actually there's some synth work on Abbey Road as well. It's like some like earliest synth stuff. So I think, they, honestly, I think they would be totally into that. I have to imagine that like 80s Beatles might be pretty comparable to like Talking Heads. Like the way that Talking Heads use like 
synths and you know and different sounds but also incorporated some like sort of like funk grooves and rock heaviness like i have to think the beatles would sort of like also be able to be kind of on that cutting edge but yeah man that's really that's really hard to say yeah i think wasn't there some story where like like lauren michaels on snl one time was like i'll you know i'll pay you guys like x dollar you know like huge dollar amount if like the Beatles get back together and Paul and John were like really close to doing it, but then just kind of like at the last minute, we're like, nah, probably not. <laughs> but it like, yeah, 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 yeah. Paul and John were both at uh, John's apartment in the yeah. Dakota and they were watching Saturday Night Live together uh, on the couch. And Lauren Michaels comes on the TV and just happens to offer the Beatles like three thousand dollars to uh, to come on. I don't think yeah, they didn't wind up going down uh, just because like I think it was like too late for them or something like that but um yeah who knows what that album would have sounded like but i, I think lauren michaels offered him three thousand dollars and said you can split it between you paul george and ringo <laughs> yeah That's funny so carson what are you up to now are you involved in any projects what's going on yeah I, I think a lot of my energy right now is sort of going into other favorite stuff as we kind of like gear up for this europe tour we are we're currently like we have one show left in a little like northeast run that we're doing and then yeah we're going to be in europe for about a month so i'm kind of just making sure i've dotted my i's and crossed my t's for, in terms of practice for that so yeah i mean really really just that and and trying to continue to post regularly on youtube and write a little bit but i don't i i don't really have any like i don't have any ambitions for much solo stuff beyond that although i don't know exactly when the next like other favorites album will be on the book so at some point in the next like six months or so it'd be cool to try to pursue like an ep or something but yeah right now pretty much just keeping up the youtube channel and getting ready for tour awesome that's exciting and where can everyone who's listening find your music yeah so my youtube channel has a lot of my solo stuff on it i think just like youtube.com slash Carson McKee or Carson McKee music. I don't know. Just <laughs> type my name into YouTube. You'll find me. A lot of my stuff, you know, a lot of other favorite stuff is on Josh's channel as well. Like you can listen to, you can watch like a video version of the entirety of our last album on Americana. And then, yeah, on basically anywhere where you stream music, Spotify, Tidal, Apple Music, whatever, you know, I have a couple of solo singles and all my work with, with Josh as the other favorites is there as well. Well, Carson, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I had a blast talking with you. Yeah, absolutely. I had a lot of fun. Always, always down to, you know, talk music stuff for 45 minutes. 